Previously on Poldark, Ross was found not guilty for the crimes committed on the beach in the last episode of season one. And that was awesome. Also awesome, Demelza's is pregnant again, but she's not so sure how Ross is going to take it. Uh, Francis has a new lease on life because uh, of the suicide attempt gone wrong. And George is uh, trying to figure out, uh, is Ross coming after him? Let's find out this week on the Lords of Grantham podcast. And after a brief uh, trip to Downton Abbey, we're back to, to Cornwall for Poldark. That we are, Dave. And, you know, we almost pushed pause again because right after we finished recording last week, yet again, Julian got us. This son of a gun always likes to drop new information about his uh, projects going on, either Downton Abbey or, in this case, the Gilded Age. The, the teaser finally dropped. We've been hearing about this show for... It seems like it, I mean, it has to be years mm-hmm, at this point. Definitely, definitely in the same conversation as Belgravia, as far as projects from Julian that were on the horizon. But this one, yeah, finally, it's it's coming. Right, it, it has some heft to it because it's going to be on HBO, and as was announced last week, it will be airing in January, which was a little frustrating for us because we're planning to return to Downton uh, ahead of the Downton Abbey two movie. But now it's just like, well, what do we do? You tell us, listeners, do you want us to talk more about Down, or do you want us to take a stab at the Gilded Age, or do you want us to do both at the same time? Do double duty. Hey. The Halcyon pl- days are upon us. Please don't ask us to do that. <laughs> That's going to be a big time commitment. That's going to be like four, four or five hours of our week right there. Yeah, rewatching some Down and, and watching a break. Well, I guess it's Gilded Age dropping. It is one a week, right? So we could just sort of burn through. I, I believe so. We could do like two Downs a week. <laughs> I don't know. That's business. You tell us, us, listeners. Yeah, you tell us tell what you us. tell us what you want us to do, and, and we'll I mean, curmudgeonly it, agree to it potentially. True to form, it would make sense for us to cover <laughs> Gilded Age after it airs because we are late to everything that we cover on this show. That is just part of the gimmick. Not that we try to make it part of it; it just is how how, how it's been. I mean, we were um, we were kind of early for the down movie, though. That's that's the one thing that we. That's the only about. time we've been on time for anything, and that's the one thing we should have been on time for. One one might say. Sure. Yeah, I think that's fair. But what do we think but about it, this Gilded Age trailer? Let's not spend too much time on it because it's not too beefy, for lack of a better phrase. I mean, yeah, we were going, we were thinking like, should we spend like a mini episode talking about this, and then. That conversation stopped immediately, I think, after you took a look at the, the trailer, Dave, and realized, oh, it's only about 45 seconds of establishing shots. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, it looks like turn of the century. I think it's New York is, is where it's supposed to be set. And, uh, you know, we see some of the cast members that are in it, Cynthia Nixon and stuff. And uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I mean, it looks good. I mean, do you think one of the reasons we're not going to America in Downton Abbey 2 is because Gilded Age is set in America? Um, no, I don't. I don't think there's gonna be a crossover like that. There'd probably have to be some kind of like agreements in there or something. I don't think. I think it's just new territory for him to you know to mine from. Okay, I'll give Julian the benefit what were you of the thinking, doubt Dave? in this instance. Okay, but uh, yeah. I mean, it looks like there's gonna be some warring families. Like one seems to be set, uh, you know, in the past. Uh, another one seems to be looking forward. So you know, typical kind of themes that we come to expect from like the Downton types where those people who are progressive and those who are not and being at odds with each other yeah old money new money kind of feels like an English game in some ways I should say though Dave as much as you know we just disproved that this may not be in the same universe as Downton Abbey according to IMDB trivia which is not ever reliable it says to be set in the same universe as Downton Abbey I don't know where they pulled that from or sourced that from and the Uh-oh. second thing is, creator Julian Fellows says that he hopes to have a younger version of the Countess of Grantham, originally played by Maggie Smith and Down Abbey, appear in the show at some point. Which, I have not seen any news on that. Uh, but, there you there you go. May- maybe. Keep, keep an eye out. Yeah. Uh, so, well, actually, 
I think that, you know there's a lot of news about the show in this past week. It may have actually come out this past week that he he mentioned that. Uh, yes, Fellows ha- did in fact tease that there will be a cameo from a young Dowager Countess. This was uh, you know it's been a busy week. We can't yeah, stay on oh, top yeah, of all the news. Week but... over here, we got stuff going on. So Dave, you you are correct. What you were just saying there, <laughs> it looks like they will be connected, maybe in some form. Wow, we're getting some multiverse situations going on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, anyways, though, we'll see. Yeah, that's the we'll big see. news of the week. But do you want to jump right into? Well, I say jump right in. We've been talking for five minutes about Gilded Age. Jump right into Poldark. Let's let's jump right in. Let's go. Poldark season two, episode three. Although, in some places, it's referred to as episode two because episodes one and two aired together almost or mm-hmm. were seen well, for as us, three. two parts we're doing this as three yep don't mess with it yeah if you're confused well we just explained it to you so hopefully you, you won't be um dave wh- wh- where does this episode start our favorite place the cliff <laughs> that is true the, the cornwall cliff there still isn't any uh uh what should call it to be seen? There's no markers for for Jim yeah, no Carter. gravestones, <laughs> not a single gravestone in sight still. Uh, yeah, Ross is returning home as we saw from his his jail thing, and we also see that George is uh, practicing boxing. Yep, and Tankard says, "I applaud he, he, your foresight." Yeah, I mean, Ross may come and come swinging at him. You know, he needs to be watch out. But uh, as George tells Tankard, you know, or as Tankard and him discuss, there's there's more than one way to to beat a man. Mm-hmm. You can you can choke him out through his finances. Yep, and then we see uh, Ross's finances aren't so hot. He owes a, he owes this fellow his friend, and we get an interesting voiceover of him reading a letter from his buddy saying, "By the way, you owe me a thousand pounds tomorrow." Right. And, 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 and that's that loan we we saw him take out in episode one of the season, already coming due. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's really coming around real quick. I don't know what, what he was thinking, really. I mean, we do. He wanted to keep his employees, you know, working and stuff, but the, the, the bill's coming due, dude. That's true. You got to pay, you know, time to pay the piper. Yeah. We, we do see Judd as being friendly again with Ross trying to get on his good side. And uh, Ross is joking around with him how he'll give him a thrashing if he doesn't get out of his way. Mm-hmm. Good old pals. Yeah, best friends. Yep. Uh, we also, you know, early on see Dwight chopping some wood by the water. Mm-hmm. And that Caroline uh, Penavin, she, she rolls by, she sees him. Yep, she just keeps staring at him. That seems to be what she does for a lot of this episode. It, it made me think, though, he's chopping wood out there by, by, by the cliff. <laughs> like... You don't think he could have chopped it anywhere else? He he brought it all the way out there to go chopping. He even had to put a stump out there. Like you, you don't think he could have chopped that wood anywhere else? No, it's a good view. Okay, it's, it is a good view. Um, we see some shot of Demelza on the beach rubbing her tummy. Mm-hmm. Because she, not that she's hungry. It's a baby. As as we recall, she is pregnant. And then we cut to the this, uh, this, the wheel laser meeting. The stockholders. This episode jumps around a lot, by the way. It does, it does. <laughs> I mean, there's really a couple things. Once we sort of hit the the the, the broad strokes, we can kind of dive into the things. Um, mm-hmm. So the wheel leisure meeting looks like a like a grown up frat meeting of these dudes palling around, and Ross is t- chit chatting about this, that, and the other. And then who walks in but our our new friend Tankard? They, that that guy's everywhere. All of a sudden, mm-hmm. they they really. Uh, are putting him into in the situation. So he is representing uh, Mr. Coke. Uh huh. Because uh, Mr. Coke had bought Jacqueline's shares or someone else's shares in Wheel Leisure. Yeah. So, and, but, uh, and, and the gimmick there is that this is really Warlock. Yeah. It's George. It's George and, and, yeah. and Pip. Mm hmm. And he just sort of is a curmudgeon. They say that. They're going to forgo their profits for a quarter if they can blast through to this, um, what is it called? This this new vein of the mine that might be more profitable. That might be the sort of hit that they need. And mm-hmm. 
Tankard is like, I don't know about this, guys. This doesn't sound like a great idea. And they're like, hey, well, we we got a plan. So Tankard. Yeah, we've already sunk a, a, a lot into this thing. You know, we got to get some return on our investment. Let's keep it going. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, yeah, Tankard is the, the lone uh, vote of no <laughs> for continuing. No, there's on one other plan. no vote, but it's only two. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So he, he's just going to be a thorn in the side there. And he's going to be involved in all the plans. There's no scheming that. Uh, Ross can really get up to because George has got an insider there now. Mm-hmm. But George, Ross doesn't seem to care much. Yeah. But what can you really do? No, oh, exactly. Uh, and we see, uh, we also see Demelza is getting mm-hmm. followed. Yeah, a man is watching her. She sees like we she she was rubbing her, her belly by the beach and she's being watched by a by a man. Mm-hmm. Captain McNeil, who we've seen and met a couple episodes ago, he was uh, one of uh, the war friends of, of Ross. Yeah, the war friend. Yeah, he was a little skeptical of what Ross has been up to there. He knew he was up to something. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he's in the neighborhood just advising on local security, you know, just dropping in. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, he is. Absolutely. That's one does. And he says that there's this fellow in town that, uh, needs help with her, his sheep and he wants Demelza to help yeah and, or a cow and, and not Ross sheep comes, it's a cow my bad yeah and Ross comes back uh, just in time to be like yeah she'll, she'll do it for a price mm-hmm. she'll take care of your animals whatever you need we need money <laughs> yeah Demelza you okay with this no not really that's great Demelza will see you tomorrow he says go do it make the money yeah, they need to rub some pennies together. Uh, it's funny, Ross m- mentions that it's been four years since Wheel Leisure uh, opened, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, where, we've, where uh, the we've years really gone? We've really traversed some time here, yeah. Uh, but, you know, as you said, uh, Demelz is off with, uh, you know, to go do this, this thing. There's also early on, uh, George invites Elizabeth... Uh, and Francis to a soiree that we hear from Francis. Oh yeah, we see that Francis, <clears throat> Francis is happy, uh, running around with his child in, in in the fields. Oh, he has a the boys. The boys living his dreams right now. The boy or Francis? Both. Yeah, he he looks like a, a happy man. And we see that. Uh, so we, they get this invitation to go to Francis's, and uh, it, it, Elizabeth gives the the note to the courier, whoever's going to bring it back, and says, "Send our regrets." And Francis says. Not our regrets, send our delight in declining this invitation. So Francis is mm-hmm. uh, unhinged in, in maybe the best way possible. Yeah, he's thriving mm-hmm. right now, living his own life. Uh, but Demelza is also upset with Ross for not sort of having her back in this instance where Captain McNeil showed up. She's like, "Why didn't? Why couldn't you sort of be there for me? Why did you like walk in?" say hi and then disappear like what's going on and ross is uh right why, why did you push me on to do this thing for him or whatever with this cow and stuff or what and, and ross is not ross is just kind of like i'm busy i got stuff going on I, we owe a lot of money yeah don't worry about it um what was it uh we, we get a brief uh interlude with Caroline who doesn't hate all the, the side areas she's staring again at I think Dwight or whatever she's man, they, just, they really need to like just streamline some of the storytelling in the show mm-hmm. they really jump around so much and you don't get bored but it like it's, uh, for our own note no taking gets, it gets tiresome it's not meant to be uh, analyzed the way that we analyze it no one thing that um, um, I noticed about about Caroline is that the costume designers for every sequence she's in Whenever she's in town, everyone's wearing like browns and beiges, and she's always wearing mm-hmm. bright colors. Right. So she's, she's got to really stand out from the crowd. And, and not even in the sense of like, Demelza wears this sort of muted green dress, the, the Shrek Fiona mm-hmm. dress, if you will. She is like yeah. the, the woman in the red dress in the Matrix. Like, that is how much she stands out. Sure. Uh, I, I, I would agree. Uh, I mean, because she's rich. Let's just burn through the but, rest of this subplot. There's really not much to say about yeah. Caroline. Uh, she, uh, you know, is out in the town, and then she thinks she's got something in her throat. It, it may be the putrid throat that's been going around that we saw 
you know, struck Elizabeth and, and Demelza. Maybe it's her time. Mm-hmm. And then she sees and, sees uh, our buddy, the doctor, in the middle of town, and she talks to him, and he's like, yeah, I think you're fine. You look fine. Yeah. And we see later there's a party, and this is the, the George party, the Warligan party, not the uh, other party that's going on that we'll discuss in a bit. Um, mm-hmm. Dr. Ennis gets called in to go treat her because she's still under the weather. Yeah. And... I think is this where it's made abundantly clear because I think it was kind of implied, but this um, member of parliament, Unwin Trevenoms, is is she is betrothed to him by uh, Ray Penavin Penvenin? Yeah, something like that. They're 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 committed to each other uh, loosely. It seems like yeah, it seems it seems like <laughs> Pen Penvenin is a uh, or rather Unwin is kind of a, a Trevenoms a dope. Oh, he's a dud. I mean, we saw him got poop flinged at him last uh-huh. episode. He's not. He's not a winner. He feels like uh, uh, the Paul Rudd character on Parks and Rec. Like he's just like, hey, I'm. I'm. I'm a politician. I'm here. <laughs> Give me the things yeah, he, that he's, I think he's a I dullard. deserve. And then we see. He's definitely a dull. We see the the good doctor sort of sneak in right under to go see this uh, Caroline. Right. I mean, they're, they're having the, the soiree that George had planned, and Trevenant's unwin. Uh, you know, I have to say his name backward. Whatever. He, he's like, I don't even know where she went. Like what's going on? <laughs> she know, she's never left a bedroom. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. Dwight goes to check check on her, and he doesn't find the putrid throat. Finds a, a dang old fish bone. <laughs> she has been in there the whole time for three days. That's bad. That's you could die. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about you, Dave, but I have not had a bone lodged in my throat for three days. That that, is, that doesn't work that way. And it wasn't like a little fish bone. It was like a rib. <laughs> Yeah, it was like tangible. You could see it. And it was also one of those things that you thought that she was kind of faking it to get his attention. Mm-hmm. And then you also heard that Dr. Choke was there and gave a, a, another opinion. So yeah. this Dr. Choke is, is worse than Dr. Clarkson. <laughs> yeah, obviously doesn't know what they're doing. Uh, you wonder, you know, the way she eats fish, is it like a cartoon character where she puts the whole thing in her mouth she's and like then a, pulls yeah, out a cartoon the bone? Cat. Yeah, and then she like she how does one get like a bone that size? When she's done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, hard, hard to believe there, but that is pretty much the whole plot of them two. Yeah, there's no. I mean, the, the table has been set. The thing with the show is that either move, it either sprints to the finish line, or it just walks. Yeah, like it's come definitely come it's strutting this one. It is strutting it out. Oh yeah, <laughs> this is Jeff Jarrett right down the aisle. So. Unlike yeah, the last time, we got like twelve minutes on this plot line for this episode, and it really just is like re reestablishing what we already know. So, and, and all right, well, this is Dwight who who caused a, a woman to be killed by her husband because he was messing around mm-hmm. with her in like a one episode turnaround. Yeah. Uh, well, let's uh, tackle. Uh, <laughs> let's just finish off Ross and Demelza. I think, yeah, because I feel like Ross and Demelza and Francis and Elizabeth all kind of tie together. And, oh, yeah. let's just, let's bring do- the doctor back in. because there's a, So what mm-hmm. happens is, we'll do the broad strokes of the big plot, and then we'll get into all the, the nuance of, of how this episode plays out. Um, yeah. Francis and Elizabeth want to have a little soiree for all of their workers for getting through this time, even though it's something that they really can't afford. And this is sort of the olive branch for Ross and Demelza to come back. And, and the good doctor is there, and there's a scene where Francis is outside, and Dr. Doctor Dwight is talking to Elizabeth, and she's like, hey, he seems real crazy. He seems like like a totally different person after what happened and, and you know, the, the trial. And I don't know if it's just because Ross got mm-hmm. off, but it, I think he tried to kill himself. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth's like, I got a really good feeling about this. I think... He he tried to kill himself, and, and she she says you shared a bedroom with him. Did he try to kill himself? <laughs> and the doctor's like, "Hey, I'm not saying what he did or did not do, but I am saying enjoy him, enjoy yeah. this new lease on life that he has. Yeah, don't think too much about it, you know. But it's it's good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you got to think that Demel, um, that Elizabeth was washing some of Francis's clothes and found some gunpowder on, on his clothes and was like, "Huh." I don't think she's good, I don't think she's that good at. I don't also don't think Elizabeth is doing the laundry, but she might be. What do you mean? They're they're a bit, they're poor. They don't have people to do it for them half the time anymore. Maybe though. I wonder if she's the one actually doing the laundry. 
She's scrubbing out his, his poop stains. <laughs> you know Francis is not clean. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, you, you hope they have some help to, to manage that right now. Um, but so, so and they circling back to... Uh, they referenced that, though, a few times this episode, though. Like, you know, you guys, you, see, you seem like you're kind of poor. Yeah, you know, <laughs> we, we got the house. He just doesn't want to invest in it, you know? Mm-hmm. So circling back to um, this debt that is owed, Demelza goes to talk to this. Is this... This is not... Um, well, this is where she goes to milk the cow, or uh, goes to... The cow man. Yeah, you know, help. Yeah. With oxen or whatever. Yeah. And... and and the dude makes a pass at her. Yeah, the old man. Uh, and that doesn't last long because McNeil is on the scene. Yeah, McNeil like steps right in and is like... Because this guy gets in real close and it's like, that is too close for comfort, sir. You need to back off. Well, you know, Demelza is basically saying that they need the money. They're, they owe their people for keeping them afloat during this troublesome time. And he's like, we can do that if there's certain contingencies. And he just straight up starts going in for it. Yeah. This is some stuff that, like, and, there's duels over in Bridgerton. Mm-hmm. There's duels over this kind of stuff in this show, too. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't... I, think, I feel like this is, like, a one-off character. I don't recall if we'd seen this old guy. Was it... Yeah, I don't know which guy it is. Yeah, I forget his name, but... He, it's not Harris Pasco, is it? I I'm I don't know. Um, Might be. Regardless, it's it's a really unfortunate no. scene, and Captain There's too many old men in this show. Mm-hmm. Too many old men in the show to keep track. Whereas like Bridgerton had too many young white boys as brothers. The show has too many old white men <laughs> to pick apart. Captain McNeil comes in and basically says like, "We're not going to let this happen to you." Yeah. Now, Dave, do you think Captain McNeil's mustache is real or not? I think it's real. Really. I think this guy probably had a full well, beard before they shot, and they had him shave it down. I think it's, like, a little too well-kept to be out of the time. Yeah, d- this guy is definitely combing his mustache. Well, I mean, I also, like I said, I think he probably had a full beard, like, the day before they shot and shaved it. Maybe. It's not a standalone mustache by its nature. That thing had a, an accompaniment. Yeah, I'm looking at a picture of this actor now, Henry Garrett, and he definitely looks like the kind who has a big, he has a big beard, but easy to, to shave so you just leave the mustache and I think he just overestimated how much mustache to leave there uh, there's a lot going on oh yeah yeah but uh but that's the last we see of him in this episode pretty much he, he saves Demelza I, I do get catch some passing glances from him at her though I mm, yep I, I feel that yeah but so, you know step off captain so w- she couldn't get the money she could not procure the funds to pay off this loan from this man whatever the old man's name mm-hmm. was but what she her and ross do they have like a tag sale on the go they sell everything everything must go yeah oh wait was it sir hugh uh, budragan budrugan hugh maybe that was the guy that there. no no it was not hugh bonneville but yeah dave as you're saying so that one thousand dollar one thousand pound loan <clears throat> they owe 40 percent, so 400 pounds they have to scare up mm-hmm. to get the investors off their back so that means selling everything they own. Yeah. More or less, including her brooch. Well, <laughs> we don't know if they pounds. actually do sell the brooch, right? We see like an exchange where it looks like they're, they're selling the brooch, but it sounds like they're giving them a low price. We only see like Ross's reaction like, huh? There's uh, there's the scene where, that scene where um, she's like, my brooch is worth this much. And he goes, that was a gift. But we'll yeah. sell it if we have to. <laughs> They're even joking, like, should we sell Garrick? Yeah, anyone got any use for that mongrel? Hey, Maybe. Garrick, Garrick is a comes into play twice this episode, so good good week for us. I feel like we hear more about Garrick than we actually see the dog yeah, anymore. Garrick just in, like, establishing shots. In the scene where Demelza bumps into Ross, uh, Demelza bumps into Elizabeth, and they talk about the baby, Demelza's mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm just here with Garrick. And Garrick is just scampering about. Yeah, Garrick it's all like, like stock footage at this old. point. Garrick is on death's door for sure at this point. The dog jumped a cliff at one point during production or something, mm. and they just got to use stock footage. Well, how many Garricks are there, do we think? There's got to be at least 15. <laughs> sure. So Just running around in the fields. Ross and, Ross and Demelza scrimp, and they sell, and they 
you know, mm-hmm. let everything go. They get the money together. And they get the money together. And the guy, the guy's like, how did you manage this? Is, is it like a friend surprised to be getting what, what you know, like he would have given him a bump. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this was such a strange sequence because it's like, you think he would be like, hey, you know, like, I understand this is a big undertaking. We are friends. So like, maybe like take some of this, keep it. But he's like, thanks for giving me everything you owe me. How'd you do it? <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah, and Ross is like direct. He's just like, we just sold everything we have. And it's like, dude, in case you ever need to take a loan out in the future, maybe it's not good to let him know that you just had to like go for broke to make ends meet this mm-hmm. time around, man. Ross is a little too uh, too honest, if you ask me. Just uh, keep it to yourself. He's a straight shooter. He truly is. Um, so, yeah, Francis uh, is throwing this party. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he, he didn't want to join whatever thing that George w- was uh, inviting them to. And we see... Yeah, Ross, I think, realizes, recognizes it's important to kind of get back in the fold with family. You know, it's better to have, you know, some friends than to keep, you know, lone wolf in it for the most part as, they, as they've done. Yeah. And they go they go out. Francis is in the field, plowing the field. And they're just friendly again. Francis is – this was – this episode was wildly uh, uh, an emotional roller coaster for me. Mm-hmm. Because I was like the happiest I've been watching TV in some time when Ross and Francis see each other. And Francis is like, <laughs> you see, he's elated. He's like, it's Ross. He's coming back. Yeah. He's my friend. And then they like. I, I like the idea, though, Ugh. Dave, that you're just watching TV in disgust most times. No, but you're I mean, like, how often things... does, does TV hit those sort of moments where you're like, these characters that, that you like are like kind of redeemed themselves. And then. Re- earning back the trust of the people it's good it's a good arc yeah yeah, yeah. Our no, boy. It, it, he was it, born in the same hospital there, we there's were. a gleam in francis's eye that you know had been missing so he got a smile back oh I guess yeah you could say absolutely and uh they do the thing where he's ho- hoisting up uh, like hay in the middle of a circle mm-hmm. and everyone's just like yeah <laughs> there's like some chant that he's saying as he hoists it up and everyone joins in it must be with, some harvest chant yeah, dying. It's like this is not dying. This is dying. Uh, I can't repeat it, folks. Um, either way, they're happy. Mm-hmm. So, oh, we did skip over that. You know, when they're in town paying off that loan, Ross is, uh, does stop by George in the street, and it's just the same thing. We kind of get the past couple episodes where they just make veiled threats at each other, where you know. I'm going to come for you, George. You just don't know it yet, bro. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, just to circle back on this, Francis being elated to see Ross, we see that Francis mm-hmm. has a lot of guilt, or there's a lot of guilt about whether or not the Francis and Elizabeth's family is what killed Julia. So I think there's a lot of mm-hmm. emotional weight on them forgiving each other. Yeah. So I think that's another reason why I think, because you, like, you understand no, Ross right. is a, being upset. Like, right, because he, he blames them for getting Demelza sick and, and their kid. Mm-hmm. It, you know, it's not Demelza going over there, which I get it. But it, it's so funny just seeing Francis up. So he's like a man of the woods now. Like before he was like complaining about blisters. Now he's just like he's got calloused hands. Uh, he's just like he's Huck Finn. He's embraced the sort of he's a man in the outside. And honestly, it, it, I think the thing is, is he's got naturally curly hair. And I think that looks like better on like a outdoorsman than like an indoors guy because indoors it's like why aren't you combing that hair mm-hmm. outside it's like i get it why why it's curly and stuff you young you're getting a lot of sunlight. yeah absolutely so uh yeah i was it he said this is i looked up he's when he holds up the hay he says i haven't i haven't i haven't and then people shout what haven't what haven't what haven't and then they say a neck a neck a neck i don't know they lost me. They lost me again. We, yeah, uh, anyways. We don't, don't expect us to look for the, the deeper meanings. This is a show about mines and miners. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. As we find out in a scene where Ross and Francis are talking. Mm-hmm. And Francis is like, hey, there's another family mine. And I've got this money that George just gave me to help pay off the debts from Sanson. And Well, no, he doesn't say explicitly like that. No, he says he has a, 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 a few hundred that he's put aside. You know he's he's done with George. He's he's got plans, and he's he's very no, he, optimistic he about. He tells Ross that it was from the situation with Ans, um, Sanson be, because Ross is like, 
You can't trust George. No. No, that's what Elizabeth tells him. Because oh, that's why he's surprised oh, later on. Okay. He doesn't outright tell him that. Uh, because that's the thing is Francis is so excited about this idea. He does, I, And this is why it's important when, it, when Elizabeth tells him. Because clearly Francis doesn't realize the implications of this money coming from George. Mm-hmm. He, he will have to pay him back somehow. He thinks he's scot-free right now, that he can try and invest this in, like, it, you know, inspecting this his mind of his, that his father left him to take up the mantle. But that ain't his money, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so when Elizabeth tells that to Ross, you can see the gears turning in Ross's head, like, oh, that's that's not great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and, and Ross and Elizabeth, I think, where are we at that point? Yeah, I mean, it, Ross had a few to drink, and he's he's looking at her pretty longingly. He, he's telling her, like, you know, you look as good as you did when you were 16. <laughs> now, now we're 25. That was nine years ago. Yeah, look the same. Doing great. And Elizabeth's like, you need to go to sleep. She says you need to calm down. You're being too loud. But at the same time, I don't think I – don't, I don't buy that Ross is going to go in for a kiss here or anything. I was – is, you you thought Ross, so? Ross is, is is not the same in this episode. This is not the, I, this is not the Ross we know. Something happened to him. I don't know. I I I've, I didn't think he was going to do anything because he is pretty adamant that you know Francis is is doing better and that you know he is very much in love with her. He recognizes that. I I didn't think he was going to do anything. I, I mean, it would be against his character. I think. I we need to see more of what's going on with Ross because I feel like Ross is a if Francis has a new lease on life, I feel like Ross is a lot more. Um, He's a renegade, and I'm 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 getting. I was nervous. I don't. This is the kind of stuff that Dwight Ennis would do, not not Ross Polark. I, I I don't know. Well, it doesn't Listeners happen. Tell us. And Demel's is sitting outside the door listening, and it's awkward, and it made me very uncomfortable. Right, Demelza had been missing from this party, and she shows up later just in time to hear this conversation with Elizabeth and Ross, and is thinking, "Oh no, he he he's going to walk out on me for this Elizabeth. It's going to happen finally." So Elizabeth is in this moment. Elizabeth has has lots of eyes on her between Ross and Francis and George. Yeah. Oh. But Ross, Elizabeth yeah. does not allow anything to happen, and Ross doesn't do anything. Mm-hmm. Ross goes to bed, and Melza is <laughs> That's like the end of the episode. Demelza is like <laughs> you and Elizabeth sound like you were having a heck of a conversation, huh? No, it's not even so much that. She's she's just kind of lying there in bed, and she looks sullen. And he's like, "What's going on? What's what's wrong?" You know. And she's like crying to herself because, yeah, as you said, like you know, you know, you were talking with with Elizabeth, and she goes on to talk about how, you know, before this is where she had told him about having a you know being pregnant the first time, kind of lets it lets it linger for a second, and he's like, "Ah, oh, nah." I knock, I got you pregnant again. I did it again. Oops. Oops. Did it again. That that's that Ross. And he and she was like, I didn't want to tell you because it doesn't seem like you want a kid. And he's like, I don't. I still don't. He also there's also the fun thing where he's like, what man does not occasionally look at another woman? He has like a very, oh, a yeah. very Seinfeld moment. He's like I didn't mean to. Do he's, it. He's an, I didn't do it. He's a straight shooter. He's a straight shooter. That's what he is. He doesn't tell any lies. No lie, no lie, no lie. Sure. Uh, but, you know, he's like, he tells you, though, he doesn't want another kid because he doesn't want to go through that pain of losing a child again. But he's like, if you're ready to, to you know, commit and do this again, I'm in. Got to do what we got to do. Mm-hmm. So they're going to have another baby. Yeah. <laughs> Which leaves, leaves us the, the main event. <laughs> <laughs> what a storyline. Judd Painter, baby. Did you? How did? Did you feel this in the moment where? I definitely was. This was a joyful episode. (laughs) I was so confused as to what was going on here. (laughs) So we see in the beginning George and Tankard and this other guy are like, we got business to take care of with Judd Painter. Yeah, it's Tom Harry who's who's rolling with Tankard. Uh That's his. That's his heavy. It's a bad heavy. Yeah. And we literally see, there's a gif of it, but just a Judd running off into the hills almost. He's got like a heck of a running gait to him. No, but we also see and Judd it, in the in the bar, like bragging oh yeah. about how he switched his testimony and helped get mm-hmm. Ross off single-handedly. 
Yeah. And then he goes to leave, and it's like, uh oh. Oh right, yeah. People are going to come after him. But with just that, that we, we then see that scene of him like running off as Tanker narrates over it. When we strike, it must be swift and out of sight. As, but like just running so slowly it's like you don't have to be that swift and out of sight you can get this guy anywhere <laughs> <laughs> literally anywhere and uh, Dave are they that swift and out of sight about how they plan to get even with uh, Judd Painter they just beat him up to death <laughs> <laughs> yeah they, they, they find him uh, walking in the woods and Tanker's like you, remember, you recall that, that bargain that we struck and credit to Judd he's just like you know, that day in court, I I, I wasn't thinking correctly. I, I couldn't, you know, recall what agreement was made. I, I don't know. And it's like, man, this guy is just playing. I'm the forgetful card. He's just playing old man, old drunk man. Yeah. And he's like, perhaps, perhaps I do recall something. I just wasn't myself in the, the court. I, I can I can give my guineas back. You know, like, look, we, we need more than guineas. He was like, look, you gave me 10 guineas, right? And they're like, no, we give you 15, you jerk. By the way. <laughs> yeah. We don't need them guineas. So Tom Harry just starts beating Judd to the point where we, we hear like the sound effects of like he's getting kicked in. There's there's going to be some blood and stuff. Oh, he's gonna, and then we see he's dead. <laughs> he is on the slab on the table, dead as a doornail. This th- this threw me. I, I was I was like I thought we were going to get more of Judd just based on his IMDb ranking in terms of like you know prominent people on mm-hmm. the show. Seemed pretty early to be losing Judd, it seems like. But, but you know, Prudy's pry- crying over his body, and a lot of friends are around <clears> too. <throat> they're they're sad, and they find money in his pocket. Yep. So the the there's talking about the speculation that this was not a hit for. Mm-hmm. You know, to rough him up and steal. This was premeditated. Yeah, they're sending a message, and we even get the scene of George uh, with Tanker being like. I didn't ask you to assassinate the guy. I just had to rough him up. <laughs> and Tanker's like, what? we got a little taken carried away. It's like, how do you get carried away with beating up an innocent old drunk? <laughs> and there's, the, there's the, the, the great Prudy sequence where she's like. Oh, oh, no, no. Before we go on, though, there's the great sequence this moment, though, where, like, that that dummy, uh, Unwin uh, Trevon, uh, Trevenance, enters the room. And then George reaches for his gold gun like he's about to, like, shoot whoever it is, <laughs> like, thinking think Ross it's Ross. Yeah, because, you know, he got news that Judd is dead. Although, you know, when Ross gets the news that Judd is dead, he's he's sad about it, but he's not, like, yeah, it was, seeking, Ross, seeking Ross, de- revenge. Ross <laughs> literally went into a five-day bender when Jim Carter died. That's true. <laughs> for for Judd, who was beaten to death because he spoke on behalf of Ross, Ross is like, he was a terrible housekeeper, but he taught me how to smoke a pipe. Now let's go to this party. <laughs> yeah, he, he's not all that torn up over. It. Uh, yeah, I guess to your point, Dave Ross is a different man this episode. Maybe, maybe his new hair piece is like taking control. Yeah, he has of him. gold bloom hair. He's definitely uh, yeah he's something. But there's the, uh, the moment where where Prudy is standing over his body and she's like, "Oh, I loved him so. He was he was such a and then she, and then whoever's like, oh, he also had like 15 guineas in his on his person. She's like, he was hiding money from me. Well, good for nothing. Yeah. It's a very good Prudy moment. Yep, and then they have this nice feast. There's all this food and, and drink around and stuff. And then we get the moment of this episode. <laughs> that he's not on the slab. He's gone. He's missing. No, no Dave, what did you think happened here? What, what did it make, make you think of? Well, I literally had a thought in my head when Judd is lying on the table. I was like, I don't know if he's actually dead. <laughs> why, why didn't you think he was dead? I don't know. I thought something was afoot. I don't know. I my my thought was, I mean, you know, Ross jokingly called Judd Judas in the last last episode. What what if you, the joke was on Ross that Judd was actually Jesus or something? You know, the old the old story where Jesus ain't there anymore. The body's missing. What if what if that was Judd? This show takes a hard turn into like Christian <laughs> yeah. prophecy. Judd was was a you know he wasn't Jesus, but he was like his brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's life of it, it, Brian, life of Judd. Yeah, it's the only way to explain what happened there. But then Judd just well, that wasn't that. stumbles in and he's alive. Yeah, he's wearing his his huge shawl, you know, that he's he's draped in. Uh, he's not he's not dead yet, and he's not thrilled that Prudy bought all funeral clothes. Yeah, 
And, he, and, and that they were drinking around him and didn't share it. He says the only thing left is a keg of brandy. Yeah. Which I, I was hoping for like a little bit more development here where he'd be like, I know who beat me up. I know who did it. Let's go get them or something. But he was just kind of like stumbling off after proving that he was alive. Yeah. And just berating Prudy for, for you know, having this party, you know, around him. And I like at the end when Drunk Ross walks into his bedroom with Demelza and they're like, mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, Judd's not dead. And Ross is like, what? And Demel's is like, yeah. I don't know. He's just alive. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I do like that. There's no reason really for Demel's to be there other than she just, you know, wanted to break from the party. Uh, you know, never fits in with those parties anyways. But she goes home just to see that Judd is alive and then goes back to tell Ross, like, oh, Judd's not dead yet. And Ross doesn't seem to care all that much I mean I think he's a little He's. I think next week he's gonna Judd's gonna have some explaining to do next week that he has like nine lives that, that he uh, cheated he death deal with the devil maybe Satan becomes a regular character on this show do you, do you think Judd's a flatliner oh absolutely <laughs> he's seen the other side he comes back I wonder if he did see that that would be a great gimmick if he turns into like a preacher who saw met God he starts having conversations with Aunt, conversations with Aunt Agatha about things he's seen. Aunt Agatha, she she talks in this episode. I like how she just makes these cameo appearances of you know yeah she's was it with Elizabeth when when Dwight walks in and it's just like oh hey Aunt Agatha and she just says something wild. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's her bit. She just says something wild this episode, and then that's it. Just bother people, yeah. Also, yeah. Uh, since we we just about wrapped the episode, um, mm-hmm. we meet Elizabeth's mom. Oh, we do, yeah. She just comes to the party to basically say that Elizabeth is uh, too good for this life, and she should Isn't be. Isn't that the truth? She should be living better. But it's like you know, mm-hmm. that's easy to say. But she's got a kid, you know. She can't. Yeah. There, she's. If she were to leave Francis, there's no way that she could recover. You know, she's done. This is what she's in for. And and she's been on the show before. She was in like uh, episode one. Oh well, of this the, you know show. She, so. This we really get to spend time with her here. Yeah, I mean, she's actually yeah she's been in a couple episodes in the first season, but yep. Yeah, well, yeah. Judd's not yeah, dead. Hardly knew you. <laughs> Thankfully, was this a good episode, Dave? This was a, an emotional episode, up and down, up and down. It was a, it was a strange episode to follow the the kickoff to the season that really you know was pretty lively, and this is just kind of feels like it's like a drunk uncle of an episode. <laughs> But in a good way, it definitely did a lot of. I think oh, yeah. hopefully the table is set for what these plots that need to finally start moving. I, I'd hope so. I, I really do. But let but, let's get let's get moving into these power rankings. Mm-hmm. What do you got on the downside, Corey? At number three, I got Prudy. She just goes through the ringer this episode. Between thinking that Judd's dead, and then him not being dead, and then him berating her, she's just having a, a rough go this week okay. of emotions. <laughs> I got Tanker so. at number three. Okay. Because I think he wants to think he's king you-know-what going to the Wheel Ledger meeting, and they're like, he doesn't get – his voice isn't even heard. Everyone's just like, screw this guy. Yeah, no one cares. And then this thing with Judd happens. doesn't work. And then yeah. in the beginning, he's he's like talking to Charles like, hey, man, look, you're getting ready to fight? And, and you know, like, he – he, I think he's overstepping, he, overstepping his own importance and then failing. Okay. I think, I think he's not a he's not he's supposed to be George's like Bobby the Brain Heenan, his manager, his sort of voice of reason. Yes. Yeah, he's not doing a great job so far. Yeah. He's, he's not a good he's not a good helper. Well, number two, I got Unwin Trevenants because oh. this guy's a dud. He's a dud. He's a, he's a dud through and through. He's not going anywhere. He's not going to get this Caroline girl. Uh, yeah, he's just a loser who almost got shot by George because he just bound into a room. <laughs> okay, well, I got to Melza because I think this is a t- this is a rough one for her. She yeah, she gets assault, uh, sexually assaulted. Not as, but you know, yeah. this, this man makes passes on her. Very inappropriate. Not cool. Ross is definitely not right. vibing with her in a lot of ways. And then she's privy to this very awkward conversation between Ross and his high school girlfriend. That is that is fair, it's. it's but uh, I did f- feel for Demelza that revealing to Ross that they're going to have a kid and him ultimately being okay 
with it was a, a big win for mm-hmm. her. Uh, number one going down, they got Tankard. He had one well, job, and he screwed it up. Yep. Ta- okay. Because <laughs> Tankard just he, – he wasn't supposed to assassinate Judd, and he almost did. And, yeah, you're just supposed to send a message, man, and you, you just couldn't even do that. <laughs> you, all you got to do is, like, punch the guy in the gut a few times. What were you thinking? Yeah. Higher, better help than Tom Harry. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, number one going down. I got Ross, man. This is a this is a tough one for Ross. You think? Oh yeah, I think I think his moments with Francis are, are in between him, literally looking at the kitchen table, saying, "We could sell one chair. We can sell everything <laughs> we own. We can give away everything we own." And then you know where he's really clinging here, trying to get something out of Wheel Leisure. And he, the stuff with Elizabeth and, and, and Demel's being right out the door is just very unsettling to me. I respected him uh, being able to, to scrape enough money to get together to get together to pay off the, the investor. So, and I, I was a little you know. perturbed by his lack of a real response towards his uh, someone he's known his whole life dying at sure. his hands. <laughs> he yeah. seems a little emotionally uh, devoid at this point, and I really want to know why. Hey, man, the guy just beat beat his case from from going to jail and he so. does say he hasn't slept since he got home so from, from yeah. jail so it's a little off well dave who's going up for you then what <laughs> number three i can't give him number one because he did get the life kicked out of him and he did lay dead mm-hmm. for a while it's judd he's at number three <laughs> okay can't give him well number number three i got the investors they got they got i mean the the, the loan investor who the loan guy the, whoever gave a loan uh-huh. to to ross he was very close to not getting his money, and uh, he should consider himself lucky that he got the four hundred that he was owed from Ross. So mm-hmm. Good for him. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Well, number two, I got I got Doctor Dwight because I think this dude is falling upward into some very good things in life. Okay. We see he's like a dude yeah. on the street treating a an average peasant woman, and then that's right. He was doing like supermodel work on and the, the red dress. Walks up and is like, "Hey, my throat hurts," and he's like, "You look good." You're good. Hello, nurse. Yeah, it's one of those things, though. You thank God there wasn't insurance back then. He's just treating people on the street. <laughs> uh, good for good for him. Well, number two, though, I got Judd. The man ain't dead. You know, y'all thought he was dead. He's not dead. Uh, he he. I mean, it's he pretty takes miraculous. the beating and he that, keeps his money. He get t- takes a licking and he kept on ticking. Good for Judd. Did he keep his money or pretty take it? Well, it stayed in the family. What do you think about the fact, though, that he was beaten and clearly had to have been undressed, though, probably to, to be on the table? Was he alive that whole time? He wasn't dead. He didn't, like. No, I know, but was he just, like, faking passed out while they just no, took his no, clothes no, off no, and no, then no, put no, him in? No. You think he was awake for that? No, I think he was conked out. I think he was done. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, number one, though, I think it's got to be. Francis. He's just so happy to be <laughs> Turn alive. Around. He had, such a, he had a terrible yeah. season one. He's like on a run. He's just got a second chance at life, and he's just relishing it. So I'm happy for him. Literally, really feel happy for and him. And he seems grateful and gracious, mm-hmm. which is very good. It's good to be alive. Amen. Yeah. Uh, I guess with that so being that's... said, we're thankful, and it's American Thanksgiving this week. So we're like Francis, we want to pay to say thank you to all our friends. Fr- Fans and friends yeah. for thankful for your support. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing I need to clear up, Dave, because we said at the top of the episode that the Dowager may appear in Julian Fellows' show. Now, after a quick investigation, this is something that was alluded to by Julian Fellows back in 2015 oh. when they first in, were talking about the Gilded Age. And news rags today have kept perpetuating the, this thing that Julian, you know, said once. And if we know Julian Fellows. The man books week to week, mm-hmm. so we can't put much stock into whether the Dowager Countess will show up or not. She'll show People up. who don't follow us closely there. don't know. We'll see. He may have forgotten. We'll see. Maybe maybe uh, the Dowager Countess has the million-dollar golden egg that Vince McMahon we'll, we'll, has. We'll see. Sure, sure. Dave, what have you been watching? Is it, is it wrestling? I think that's I – I, I don't think I'm watching anything else this week. I feel like after the where Sopranos, a, a golden I'm, egg was I'm, I'm, stolen from CEO of WWE Vince McMahon. Yep, that was the the, the bleeding plot line. Yep, and one of the biggest pay per views of the year in Brooklyn. 
I considered buying tickets. Oh man, that would have been a waste. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what about you? Anything good? I finally finished the Korean drama Hometown Cha Cha Cha. This is my second big one this year after Crash Landing on You. These shows take so much time because it's 16 episode seasons, hour and 20 minute episodes at least. So it's at least 20 hours Oof. to watch one of these things. And uh, yeah, it was, pre- it was pretty pleasant. That's a, gr- it was pretty light. a ringing endorsement considering your description. It started out, it started out good, but it, uh, it kind of just kind of got a little too dramatic for my taste. You, you, not, not essential watching. Okay. Noted. Yeah. And I, oh, I watched, though, I did watch the Alanis Morissette documentary on uh, oh, the HBO. HBO. Is that good? I liked it. I know Lance Morris had disord- um, disowned it, uh, but I don't see what about it was like so off. I, I it, was, it was enjoyable. Good piece of nostalgia if you missed out on that era. Okay. Really yeah. I mean, I, I like the Woodstock one, so maybe I'll watch the Atlantis one. I didn't realize the drummer for Foo Fighters was her original drummer. And he's, uh, Taylor Hawkins? Uh, Taylor Hawkins. Yeah, he's primarily in it. So Interesting. Maybe I'll give that a watch. Yeah. It's, it's worthwhile. But, uh, that's it. That's it. I'm just ready for some Thanksgiving. I'm hungry. Mm-hmm. Dave, you hungry? Oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, well, I mean, we're <laughs> okay. recording this a little later than we normally do, so not not right now. But we'll check see. on you in a day or two. We'll see. Yeah. Well, until then, you know where to find us: Facebook, Gmail, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter Podbean, website. Leave five star reviews if you want. If you need some, start your Christmas shopping. We gotta get some merch out there, Dave. We need to we get do. on that. We need those fans. We need graphic designers. Anybody to step up, we'll pay. We'll pay you. We need to figure this out. We we, we need to do like Ross and, and you know put our coins together and, and figure out a way. Yeah, I mean, and, and speaking of putting those coins together, Patreon. We got a new episode coming within the next couple of days. Summer in mm-hmm. February, starring Dan Stevens. Get excited! Oh yeah. But until then. You'll hear us again on on the podcast because we are not taking a break with Pole Dark. We're on a we're on a timeline here, so we oh, gotta shit, keep we moving. Gotta keep on running. Yeah. So we'll catch you next time on the pod. Yeah.